Amen. Good to see everybody back after the big blizzard of 2016. If you have your Bibles this morning, we'll turn to Acts chapter 27. Acts chapter 27. We're going to talk about four anchors for the new year. Everybody likes to make the New Year's resolutions, and perhaps by now, as we get ready to enter February tomorrow, some of those resolutions that may have already gone by the wayside, but the spiritual resolutions are the ones that are important, to, not just for this year, but really for a lifelong work and walk in the Christian life and walking with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is a story from Acts, and we're going to talk a little bit about what Paul went through in this particular situation. Acts chapter 27, verse 20. When neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. But after long abstinence, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened unto me, and not have loosed from Crete, and to have gained his harm, this harm and loss. And now I exhort you, be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar, and lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me. Howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island, but when the fourteenth night was come, as we were driven up and down in Adria, about midnight the shipmen deemed that they drew near to some country, and sounded and found it twenty fathoms. And when they had gone a little further, they sounded again and found it fifteen fathoms. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon the rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. Now, Paul had appeared before Agrippa and had given his Christian testimony, and Agrippa decided to send him to Rome to appear before Caesar. Remember, Paul said, I'm a, I'm a citizen, a Roman citizen. And it was past time for sailing. They, they did their sailing during the Medi in the Mediterranean Sea during certain times of the year when the seas were uh, much calmer. And then there was a certain time of the season, much like a growing season and a reaping and harvesting season, there were certain times of the year where you just didn't want to venture out too far into the sea because that's when the storms were more likely to kick up and uh, you were more likely to have a rough time crossing the sea. And it was already past the season in this particular year for them to really be safely sailing uh, upon the Mediterranean. And sure enough, a big storm kicked up. And uh, as we're told there, uh, when the 14th night was come, this is a two-week storm, basically, uh, that they were out in the midst of the sea. And uh, they were probably just riding right along with the storm. Of course, they didn't have all the fancy GPS and meteorological tools that we have today. And so they would uh, try to sail by the stars, but if there's a storm, you can't see the stars because of the clouds. And so they're kind of lost and tossed to and fro, and they don't know if they're on the eastern side or the western side or northern or southern sides of the, of the ocean. They just know that they're out in the middle somewhere, and at any time, a big wave could crash into their boat, maybe capsize them, or perhaps make it just a pile of splinters. So uh, they were a little concerned. Actually, they were quite concerned. But they sailed against the advice of Paul. Paul told them ahead of time, he said, you really shouldn't cast out at this time. It's not the right time of the year, but they were determined to go. Probably had some cargo that they were going to be able to make some money off of. And if they were, could complete this particular voyage, probably, you know, try to sneak one more voyage in before the end of the season, they could get paid. And uh, so maybe greed played a little part in this reason why they were out sailing when they really should not have been against their better judgment. And I'm sure they probably thought, well, what does a missionary, what do the, one of these wacko Christians know anyway about sailing? You know, we're uh, seamen, we've been doing this for all of our lives, we know what we're doing, we think we can sneak another voyage in there. But a great wind blew around them for several days, and finally they started losing all hope. And they thought, this is going to be it, we uh, pressed our luck, and unfortunately uh, we've seen these kinds of things before, and ships very rarely ever get through these kinds of storms. But then Paul came up from the bottom of the ship and said, don't worry, the angel of God came and visited me. He said, we're going to uh, reach shore, and not only that, everybody is going to be saved, however, we're going to lose the ship. So the ship will be destroyed, but your lives will be spared. And he said, don't fear, don't worry about that. When they did that, they saw that they were close to a country, an island or some sort of land, and so they sound the, uh, the fathoms, and what it is, they were trying to see how deep the, the ocean was at that point. And they did it first, uh, and they found out that they were about 20 fathoms uh, uh, deep in water. They went a little further, close to the shore, found that it was just 15, so they were getting closer and closer to the shore. They said, we don't want to go any further because of the storm. We can't see where the rocks are. You know, if we sail into a rock, so these are wooden boats, they'll just, you know, rip it to shreds. So they dropped four anchors to hold them steady 
until the storm is over. So we're going to talk about four anchors that will hold us steady in this new year uh, this morning. The first one is the book. You're holding the book hopefully in your hands right now. The Bible is the book. It's a book to proclaim. And someone made the observation, I thought it was pretty astute, it says we spend too much time defending the Bible and not enough time proclaiming the Bible. Everybody wants to attack us, so that's true, but we're spending so much time saying, but it's true, but look at this, but look at that. Instead of saying, trying to be on the defensive, we should be proclaiming the book. We should be proclaiming God's truths in the book and saying the book is true and it is a, a, an actual account. It's historical, it's factual, and here's what it has to say about you and your uh, eternal condition. That if you don't accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, when you die, you will not spend eternity in heaven, but you will spend eternity in hell. And we need to be very plain and very simple about it. There's a, yeah, a lot of deep theology that you can dig into in the Bible, but the message itself is simple, and we need to proclaim the message instead, instead of retreating all the time. There was a, a story, there was a big German shepherd penned up, and there was a little feisty dog, one of those little heel biters, they would come along the fence and agitate the big shepherd. The shepherd couldn't get out. Uh, the owner, would, uh, the shepherd would snap at the little dog through the fence, and the man who owned the shepherd didn't know what to do because it was agitating and irritating his German shepherd. His friend said, it's simple. Let the big dog out. <laughs> Watch that little dog scurry along. So we don't need to argue the Bible or defend the Bible. We need to proclaim the Bible. We need to let the big dog out. And then to let the Bible go and do what it was designed to do, which is to profess the gospel message of Jesus Christ. As I mentioned the last couple of weeks, the old-time preachers uh, were the ones who often would usher in great revivals, whether it was Moody or Finney or Spurgeon or Graham and uh, so forth. And then with great revival always came great preaching, but it was great preaching that came first. And then people would come under conviction of the Holy Spirit and they would yield to the Holy Spirit and they would give their hearts to the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and then revival would happen because one person would come forward and accept Jesus Christ, and then two, then four, then eight, then fifty, then a hundred, then a thousand. And before you knew it, you would have revival breaking out throughout a country and perhaps throughout a region of the world. But it had to do with the Bible, starting with proclaiming the Bible. The philosopher Voltaire, who was a noted deist, said, If we would destroy the Christian religion, we must first of all destroy man's belief in the Bible. Because without the Bible, we have no religion, we have no faith, we have no means for our faith. It's what explains to us the reason for our faith. It explains to us who God is and what He has done for us and how He continues to love for us and how He continues to do for us. But without that, it's very difficult to have faith, but we have His full and complete Word. How many of you got saved by reading Shakespeare? Or how many of you got saved by reading the Reader's Digest? Or by reading... Uh, uh, a magazine, or by Googling something. Now you got saved probably by someone preaching the Bible to you or witnessing to you out of the Bible, sharing Scripture with you, and that is because the Bible is quick and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It is powerful. It is God-breathed, that the Bible says. It actually uh, is God's uh, breath into it. It has a, it's a living entity. In Job 26.7 it says, he, str he stretched out the north over the empty space, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. And so God has this, uh, by His Word, He has been able to create the entire universe. Forty different writers in the Bible wrote it through a, a span of 15 centuries, 1,500 years, and has been virtually unchanged for 2,000 years, and yet is still the highest revelation of the spiritual worship of the human soul. No other book, although many have tried, no other book can come anywhere near that kind of accuracy and that kind of longevity without being pulled apart and being torn down and being exposed for the, the hypocrisy that is inevitably in it. Only the Bible has been able to endure for all these centuries and millennia. One preacher said, The reason God came from nowhere, but there was nowhere to come from, and coming from nowhere, He stood on nothing. The reason He stood on nothing was there was nowhere for Him to stand. And standing on nothing, he reached out where there was nowhere to reach, and caught something when there was nothing to catch, and hung something on nothing and told it to stay there. That's a description of the universe. Pretty clever. When this was written, almost all men believed that the earth had some kind of solid foundation. When Job wrote this uh, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that God stretched out the north over the empty space and hangeth the earth upon nothing. At that time, 
the religions of the world thought that there was a, some kind of solid foundation under the earth. The Egyptians believed that the earth was supported by five pillars, one on each corner and one in the middle. The Greeks believed that the earth was born on the shoulders of Atlas. The Hindus believed that the earth was balanced on the back of a gigantic elephant. The elephant was standing on the back of an immense turtle, and the turtle was swimming in a cosmic sea. And when the turtle moved, it accounted for the earthquakes in the earth. So they believed that the earth had to be on something. It couldn't just be out there in nothingness. How could it possibly just not be on, on anything? And yet Job, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, was accurate and said it is hung on nothing. It's just out there in space, in a vacuum. So the Bible, once again, more accurate than science was of the day. You know, the Bible is more accurate today than science is today. Scientists are still trying to tell us we came from monkeys or from the sea amoebas or something like that. But the Bible says that we came from the very breath of God as he molded us from the clay of the earth. Eventually, science will catch up to us. But for now, we have to put up with their nonsense that we came from some lower form of life. The Bible said the earth was circular and a sphere when science said it was flat. Eventually, science caught up to the Bible as well. Scientists said at one time the earth was the center of the universe. And then they got a little bit smarter. They said, well, actually, it's not the center of the universe. The sun is the center of the universe, and we go around the sun. Well, they got that part right. But the Bible said that they, the stars are countless. Remember, he told Abraham, your descendants will be like the stars. They'll be innumerable. It wasn't until we had more powerful telescopes, and we looked further and further out into space, and realized, well, there's more stars behind what we can see. Then there's more stars behind that. Then there's more stars behind that. And then we put up things like the, the Hubble telescope, and we can't even count the galaxies, let alone the number of stars. Well, the Bible told us that right from, from the beginning. But science wouldn't believe it. And now science, in my opinion, I believe that science exists to prove that the Bible is true. That's the purpose of science. Now, if you try to tell a science teacher that, they'll scoff, and they'll look at you funny, and you say, you know, prove me wrong otherwise. I've got the proof here in the Bible. The Bible's been right every time. Archaeologists. They claim that some of these ancient civilizations described in the Bible never existed. Every time they dig into a new mound of earth, they find out, yes indeed, that village did exist and that civilization existed, just as the Bible described it in the Old Testament. They have yet to find an error, scientific error, in the Bible. And they've been trying for thousands of years to find these errors. They have not been able to find a single scientific error in the Bible. And i got a news for them. They won't. So stop trying. They won't, but... Isaiah 40, 22 says, It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth, not the flat earth, the circle of the earth, and the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. In other words, it's a vast area, vast space. And this was written hundreds of years before it was established that the earth was round. Henry Ward Beecher said, Sink the Bible to the bottom of the ocean, and man's obligations to God would be unchanged. He would have the same path to tread, only his lamp and his guide would be gone. He would have the same voyage to make, only his compass and chart would be overboard. The Bible is our compass in life. It's what we need to guide us through life. It has all of God's treasures, all of God's promises, all of God's proofs. President and Former General and President Ulysses S. Grant, President after Abraham Lincoln, Hold forth to the Bible and the great anchor of your liberties. Write its precepts in your hearts and practice them in your lives. To the influence of this book we are indebted for all the progress made in human civilization, and to this we must look as our guide to the future. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So even our forefathers understood the importance of the Bible. So we must preach against sin, and we can use the Bible to do that. The wages of sin is death. No matter what modern culture tries to define as sin or tries to say what used to be sin is no longer sin. It's politically incorrect to call that a sin anymore. It's everything is permissible. Sin will, will destroy a life. Sin will destroy a family. It will destroy a community. It will destroy a nation. It will destroy a world. It destroyed the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire lasted a long time. It was the most powerful empire. There were no enemies dare come against the mighty Roman Empire. And yet it's destroyed you don't see that anymore. People don't go around calling themselves Romans anymore. At best, Italians. And that part of the world, Gauls and so forth. We will be persecuted if we do preach against sin. 
but we cannot live in the jet set, the fast lane, or the social scene and still have the power of God to be able to proclaim that. That's a compromise. We cannot compromise. And the Bible, if we stay true to that, will not allow us to compromise. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and the marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. The Bible will seek you out and find you. And it will find you in your thoughts, deep down in your heart as well. We must stand for Bible reading and praying together. It's important to read the Bible. It's important to read the Bible every day. We can watch television every day. We can certainly read the Bible every day. We must religiously educate our children. This begins in the home. Parents and grandparents and great-grandparents and aunts and uncles. Anybody who has any kind of influence over children, religiously educate your children at home. Yes, we provide that here on Sunday mornings for an hour or so, but your children have a lot of other free time during the course of the week with a lot of other bad influences surrounding them. Religious education begins at home and continues in the church. Ideally, if you had the time, the money, and the resources, even in the schools and colleges that we choose for our children, we know that that's not, unfortunately, that's not always possible or practical or affordable. But when it is, I certainly would encourage you to do so. As a graduate of a Christian university, I can't just can't express upon you how important that was to me in my own personal spiritual growth. And yet I grew up in church with a father who was a pastor and a mother who was an organ player and a Sunday school teacher and who made me read the Bible every night before I went to the bed. And, and uh, before I could read, they read to me. When I was old enough to read, I read to them. And we prayed before every meal. And we had those kinds of things. And every time the church door literally was open, I was in the church, because I had to be. That was my ride. <laughs> so, but I, I can t cannot tell you, in those 18 years leading up to that, how much I grew and, of course, became a born-again Christian. But in the four years in a Christian college setting, it's like a master's degree in just living a Christian life. If you could ever at all possibly afford to send your children or grandchildren to a Christian school, whether it's elementary, middle, high school, or and or a Christian college, certainly would encourage you to try to do it under uh, as any way possible. And if you'd like to do that and don't have the money, pray. Start praying now and asking God to provide a way, provide a scholarship, provide a grant, provide a series of scholarships and grants. You want to know how to do that? Ask Jo. Her family did not have much money. She was the oldest of eight children. Her parents couldn't afford to put eight kids through school, and yet she managed to get through college and uh, did it in a couple of phases. Didn't do it all in four years. Had a work scholarship uh, program up in what we call the aerobic center, which is where the, the, the kids, uh, the students had their gym with basketball courts and racquetball and track, indoor track and all that. And that's where she worked while she was at uh, Oral Roberts University uh, for several, whatever many hours a, a week. So if I wanted to go see her, I had to go up to the aerobic center, which was fine because I like playing all those sports in any way. But she'd be at their desk and she'd be checking on badges or whatever it is that they had her do uh, during the course of the week. So there are ways to do that if you really, really want to do that even if you don't have the money, and her parents certainly couldn't help her, taking out student loans, all those kinds of things as well, if you really want to do it, and I encourage you to seriously consider that. So number one anchor is the Bible. Number two, the bride. That's you, that's me, that's the church. Has the church failed? We've talked about this several times in the past as well. We have liberal churches, moderate churches, conservative churches, fundamentalist churches, all different kinds of churches, and yet one same God. Why do we have so many different kinds of churches and so many different philosophies? And some of those are diametrically opposed. So here's the bottom line. Somebody's wrong. Can't all be right because they're diametrically opposed. So which church is right? Well, we'd like to say we're one of the right ones. But what we try to do is we try to live according to the first anchor, which is the Bible. If you go by the Bible and you live by the Bible and you interpret the Bible accurately, you can't go wrong. So that is our goal in this church, is to try to, as the best of our understanding, as we're led by the Holy Spirit, to conduct ourselves in worship in this church and the ministries through this church according to the Bible. doesn't mean that we're perfect. doesn't mean that we don't make mistakes. But it does mean that is our ultimate uh, desire and our ultimate goal, is to always have the church be the bride of Christ as it is designed by the Bible. I believe in a local church. Local church, one can find Jesus, discover and exercise spiritual gifts, evangelize the lost, help the needy, pray, enjoy fellowship, all those things that you get to do in a local church. 
I run across many people who say, well, my church is so-and-so pastor and brother evangelist on TV Sunday mornings. I watch him religiously every Sunday morning. I spend an hour and I follow through and the notes and sometimes I even buy the book or the tape. And well, That's all well and good, but you're missing out on a big part of the Christian experience as part of the bride of Christ. We need each other. We need to know that each other are there for us, for each other. Days, uh, weeks like this when we have snow. If you're snowed in, and I've already heard some testimonies where somebody helped somebody else with a snowblower, or helped somebody else with a shovel, or helped spend some time clearing driveways and sidewalks, and we know that the church was there ready to help them out. Um, if we have things like the, the clothing closet, we're there to help each other out. It's not just for people outside the church. We've had people in the church also take advantage of the clothing closet, not just donating, but also receiving as well. So, praying together. Maybe you have a friend in the church here that you can go to, uh, not everybody always comes to the pastor, and I understand that for whatever reason, although I certainly would hope everybody would feel comfortable, but you may feel more comfortable discussing maybe certain personal issues with a, with a friend in church, more so than the pastor. And that's the case, it's nice to know that there's somebody there, but how would you know unless you came to church and you got to know them, and you fellowshiped with them, and you, whether it's Sunday school or Bible study or women's dinner or men's fellowship or Sunday school or, or gathering after church out in the vestibule. And that's how you get to know people. Look, folks, we're all going to be stuck with each other for all eternity, so we might as well start getting along here now. Say good things about your church. A lot of people, a lot of naysayers. Well, my church, well, my pastor, well, those people live on the other, or sit the other side of the church, or, or that choir director, or that uh, so-and-so in our church, you know, just can't get along. Be positive. Say good things about the church. That's the bride. You're part of the bride. It's part of your family. We're all part of the body of Christ. Tithe, give sacrificial, be dependable, get plugged in. As much as I would like to be at all places at all times, I can't always be everywhere all the time. I still have jobs to do as well outside the church. And that's one of, been one of my prayers all along. That someday I pray that the church will grow to the point where I won't have, any, have to have any outside uh, work interests. And that's up to God's glory. I mean, there are many uh, pastors who have spent many years, all their entire pastor, having to have second or third jobs. That's it's. Very often, very uh, uh, common, that's fine. Uh, but it, uh, it is uh, nice, I would think, to be able to just do that full time, just pastor full time. It's God's will, up to Him. But in the meantime, while I am called away, and I'm in the mornings, especially uh, in communicado for the most part, from 7 to 10 in the morning on the radio, and there's an emergency, you should be able to not only leave me a message, which is about the best you're going get to get to do, but if you need somebody to pray for something right away, Call somebody in the prayer list. Call somebody else in the church and get them to start praying in the meantime. When I'm done, I'll look at my messages or whatever. It's, oh, so-and-so needs prayer right away or so-and-so needs to be visited right away. I can go do that then. But don't wait for me, necessarily, is what we're trying to say. We can all minister to each other. That's the bottom line. Coach G.T. Thames said, The preacher and the coach are a little different. The coach teaches his players but never gets into the game. The preacher teaches his members and then plays the game by himself. Unfortunately, that's true, but it doesn't have to be true. He should play the game with everybody else in the church as well. We're all ministers and priests. You understand what the, church, what the Bible says? In the Old Testament, you had the ordained priests, and uh, then you had the, the kings, the people who ruled. So the tribe of Judah was the ruling tribe. That's where King David came from. You had the Levite, the Levitical tribe, the priestly tribe. In the New Testament, we are all kings and priests. So you don't have to just go to an ordained minister to have someone pray for you or to have someone minister to you. You can go to any believer and they would be able to do the same thing. Ephesians 5.25. Ephesians 5.25. Talks about the bride and it, and it gives us an analogy of our earthly husbands and wives and families. Husbands love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. How did Christ give himself for the church? He died for it. He gave everything. He gave any, everything he possibly could give, including his entire life for the church. Husbands, that's how you're supposed to love your wives as well. Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. By the word. That he might present it to himself, a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. That is what we are supposed to be. We are supposed to be able to be presented by Christ to God the Father, holy and without blemish, pure and spotless. 
Well, as I just said, the church has got plenty of spots and plenty of wrinkles because there are churches out there who are going in opposite directions. And I can tell you right now, going in the opposite direction of the Word of God. And they're going to have to be held accountable, and they will be held accountable on the Day of Judgment. I think about that probably more often than I should. As a pastor, the Bible says that I'm held to an even higher bar because I'm going to be held for every word that I speak from the pulpit or from a Sunday school lecture or from a one-on-one -on -one, uh, counseling session or whatever it might be. As a pastor, I'm expected to be a spiritual leader. I'm expected to know the Bible and I'm expected to be able to convey the Bible's truths to whatever situation we're facing at this particular time. I'm going to be held accountable. I'm going to be standing for God's holy throne on the day of judgment. And he's going to go back and say, remember what you were preaching on January 31st, 2016. Remember the text that you used. Hopefully at that point he will say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. On the other hand, he may say, you misinterpreted the word at that time. And when it was obvious <coughs> what, it should have, what you should have said instead of what you did say. I mean, I'm going to stand here and say that I have been perfect for every single minute of my life because nobody has. But... I pray each and every day and each and every Sunday that what I convey to you is the truths of God's Word. Ephesians 5.25 again, Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it that He might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the Word that He might present it to Himself a glorious church not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing but that it should be holy without blemish. When you sin as a member of the bride... As a member of the church, as a member of the body, you bring spots and wrinkles onto the body of Christ. That's why it's quick and important for us to repent of any sin that we might have. The third anchor is the blood. The gospel we preach is a gospel of redemption. The symbol for Christianity is not a burning bush or a tablet of stone or the seven-branch lampstand or a halo or a golden crown. It's the rugged, bloody cross of Christ. The empty cross of Christ because He is risen again. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power and are you washed by the blood of the Lamb this morning as the hymn goes? It's important to have those sins washed away by the blood. Paul had a lot of credentials. However, he gloried in the cross. The cross shows the ugliness of sin and the blessedness of the Savior. Because all of our sins were nailed to that cross, nailed to Him. He took upon Him the sins of the entire world, your sins, my sins, sins before He died, sins after He rose again, Sins during the three days while he was in the grave. He took all those sins upon the cross. Shed his blood for our <coughs> sins. The cross answers two questions for us. Number one, how far will man go in his rejection of God? Well, he'll go all the way. He will place the loveliest life that ever, uh, ever lived on a cross. That's how far man can be depraved to actually taking the Son of God and nailing him to the cross. And you can say, well, Pastor, had I been alive back then, I certainly would not have been the one there. Yes, you would have because your sins nailed him there. Your, your sins nailed him there today in the 21st century. And his blood was shed to wash away those same sins that you used to nail him to that cross. Second question, how far will God go in his redemption for mankind? As we already said, he will go all the way. Sending his only begotten son. 1 Peter 2.24 Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness. Righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Hebrews 12, 2. Look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Despite the humiliation of the cross, being hung up there, people mocking him, spitting at him, they were beating him beforehand. The horrible things that they were saying about him, the religious leaders who were mocking him, all right, so you're the son of God, all right, you know, jump down off the cross. Come on, let's see it, big boy. You talk a big game. I'm here. I'll believe if you jump down off the cross. Completely misunderstanding the reason why his blood was being shed in the front of their very eyes for their very sins, for the very mocking that they were doing at that time, but they were too blind, spiritually blind, to understand what Jesus was doing for them. And he does for us. John 12, 32, Jesus said, And if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. Number four, anchor, the blessed hope. Jesus will come as a thief in the night. Night, His coming is preeminent. In that hour, people that think not, the Son of Man cometh, the Bible said. Just when we're comfortable in our religiosity, we're comfortable in our life, we're comfortable in this world, 
we think, well, things are going rather smoothly, at least for me. I know there are trouble spots in the world, and I'm concerned about that. And we have a big election coming up in this country this year. And we're concerned about that, and, you know, uh, so on and so forth. But, you know, my family, my, me, we're, we're okay. And then we kind of get comfortable in our religious uh, work, and we don't read the Bibles maybe as often as we used to. Maybe not pray quite as much or as fervently as we used to. And then, bam, Jesus will come. We, when we were at least expecting it. He'll come and it'll be open, it'll be visible, it'll be triumphant. We are to be watchkeepers at all times. Psalm 43, 5. Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise Him, who is the health of my countenance and my God. Closing turn to Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2. Paul and his crew were cast uh, about in, this, in the sea until they dropped four anchors to steady the ship, to steady the boat, so that they could make it to shore in the midst of the storm. We're in the midst of a big storm, a big spiritual storm in this world right now. We need anchors, spiritual anchors, to hold us true in the storm so that when uh, we can be guided in the storm, let the stuff and the mess of the world swirl all around us, but we're going to stay true to the Word of God and true to our relationship with God. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, we should live righteously, we should live godly in this present world, not wait until we get to heaven, but now we should do these things. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that we might redeem us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Are you zealous of good works? Are you excited about doing something for the Lord? Are you excited about praying, interceding on behalf of other people? Are you excited about taking the prayer sheet with you and praying for us throughout the course of the week? Are you excited about sharing the good news, the gospel message with your family, with your children, grandchildren, extended family, neighbors? Are you excited? Are you zealous of good works? These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee or discourage thee. The world wants to discourage you because they don't want to hear about their sin. And yet we are to be a light in the dark world. And the light shines in darkness and the darkness comprehendeth it not. They don't understand it. So we have to pray that the Holy Spirit will go before us and the Holy Spirit will convict them. The Holy Spirit will open up their hearts to be receptive to the word that we have for them each and every day. Do you have a word on your lips guided by the Holy Spirit for someone today? Are you thinking of somebody in your life and in your cross that will cross your path perhaps today or this week that you know what, I really have a burden for that soul, for that brother, for that sister, for that child, for that whoever it might be. I really am praying for them because I know they don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. I don't want them to die and spend eternity apart from God and apart from me and apart from the rest of our loved ones. I want them to spend eternity with me. Someone took the time to witness to me. The least I can do is turn around and share that good news with somebody else. I can't force them to accept Jesus Christ, but I can certainly share with all the passion that I can muster what God did for me, and He'll do the same for you. Amen. Let's have that kind of passion as the bride of Christ <coughs> on the Bible with the blessed hope, sharing the blood of Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your loving kindness and tender mercies. We thank You, Lord, that we have these spiritual anchors in our life. We thank You, Lord, that as a result of our relationship with You, we have the blessed hope. We know uh, where, we, where our eternity is going to be spent. But we also know many people who don't know and don't understand where their eternity is going to be spent. So, Father, our burden is for them. Our burden is to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Our burden is to take every opportunity to say a good word in season, to share a scripture, to share a prayer, just to let someone know we're thinking of them. Perhaps through our deeds, Lord, to show through our hands and through our gestures and through our feet that we have the love of Christ in us, sacrificially going about our life, caring for other people. But thank you, Lord, for your blessings in this church. I thank you, Lord, for everybody here who plays a part in making this church what it is today in this community, whether it's through prayer, Bible reading, teaching, uh, whether it's Sunday school, whether it's uh, some other form of ministry in the church or a ministry through, through the church. Lord, I just thank you that we all have a part to play in this body. I pray that you'll find us, Lord, to be about your business. When you do come, when the Father turns to the Son and says, Go get my people, I pray that we will not be caught by surprise. We will be caught with a joyful heart, ready to go, looking skyward as our redemption draweth nigh. 
If you're here this morning, though, and you have not accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, He stands ready with loving, open, nail-pierced hands. His arms are there, extended, open wide, ready to give you a big, heavenly, holy hug, welcoming you into His family. If you'll just say, yes, Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner. I'm a, I need a Savior in my life. And that Savior can only come through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And I accept your gift of salvation. Thank you for creating me as a new creation in Christ Jesus. My old sinful self is gone, and I now look forward to a righteous life with you. As Christians this morning, hear our prayers, Lord. Lift up our prayer requests that were mentioned earlier. May all we say and do be pleasing in thy sight. Today, this week, and forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.